Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much for coming. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about uh, another technique, optical imaging microscopy, optical microscopy, and namely far field optical microscopy. And uh, the question that was just raised of uh, how to tell two things apart that are really close together is uh, basically the major topic of my talk today. Because here, again, we have to deal with resolution. We want to have very fine details um, analyzed in our samples. And the question is whether we can assess these details with far field optical techniques. So I'm going to start with wave optics a little bit. Uh, it's not going to be too much physics here and some uh, topics of microscopy resolution in general. And then I'll introduce you to some advanced microscopic far field light micro microscopy methods. The first that was uh, commercially available is the 4Pi confocal laser scanning microscope. Um, that was commercialized by Leica Microsystems. And then there's a, a whole bunch of new techniques arising now. Um, and they all uh, deal with imaging in uh, some, some way or another in nonlinear uh, regime. So basically, with all the novel techniques, um, we have no resolution limit in far field light microscopy um, when it comes from yeah, technical aspects. However, of course, there is uh, noise, the signal to noise ratio, which affect our images. And there's also the, the matter of acquisition time uh, that limits our resolution. So here we can make use of photo switchable, photo activatable fluor force. We can use that microscopy. And then there's another technique that uses blinking of quantum dots or um, in the case of localization microscopy. So, uh, down here, we use blinking of individual floor force. Um, and then there's, of course, these, uh, these other techniques, palm, storm, F-palm, um, and the like. There's all different names for basically the same type of imaging um, but that circumvents the conventional resolution limit in far-field light microscopy. So we're dealing with light waves here, not ultrasound waves anymore. So we have to look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Here we're in the optical regime, um, the visible light, 380 to about 780 nanometers. These are the wavelengths that we use for imaging. Again, here the wavelength gives you a rough estimation of the resolution that you can, can achieve. Basically, it's half the wavelength that you'll see in a minute. Um, so we could, if you use uh, the violet blue light, we could achieve resolutions um, down to 200 nanometers, roughly, in uh, using using a far-field light microscopy. So an electromagnetic wave that we use for imaging, it has um, um, an electric magnetic component. They are perpendicular. Um, so the electric field might go in this direction, the magnetic field up and down. And uh, the propagation direction would be in this direction. So they are all perpendicular. And this is what we use for, for imaging. Um, we put these light waves into um, our microscopes, for instance, we use um, wide field illumination, put on a plain sound wave, uh, plain light wave, and look at uh, the diffraction uh, of our object. <coughs> we see that there's uh, diffraction from the yeah, various, in this case, um, yeah, when, when we're not dealing with impedance here, but we're dealing with the refractive index. There's differences, local differences in the refractive index. So we'll have diffraction. And uh, light is going in different directions here. And we use a microscope lens to detect the light. And we see, and as a result from our detected image, we see a blurred, uh, a blurred image. So this would be the original. This could be the detected image. Um, and uh, you already know that um, here the resolution, of course, cannot be infinite far field light microscopy in general, um, but it has to be somewhere near half a wavelength of uh, the light used for imaging. And okay, how can we understand uh, the resolution limit here in terms of diffraction? Well, we can sort of um, assume our object to be, a, well, the simple geometric object, the line object here, a grating different lines. We shine in our laser light and we get diffraction in various directions. So there's the zero order diffraction and first plus and minus order diffraction. If we can detect these first plus minus order, then um, we can also resolve these objects. We get lines here that are of course blurred, but no matter what, we can still measure, for instance, distances here. So we can basically resolve these lines. 
if the grating is finer, if there's finer object structures that we want to resolve, then we have a, a stronger diffraction and the plus minus order going uh, steeper. And they just barely resolved here, but you can imagine if you paste them even, even closer, then eventually you will have only a blurred image of you don't know what. So uh, just to let you know, the finer structures we have, the smaller distances, the, yeah, the smaller structures we want to resolve, uh, we get higher diffraction and, well, Ernst Abbe found out some more than 100 years ago that the first order of diffraction, plus minus orders, they have to be imaged by the detection objective lens in order to uh, resolve these objects. So now we come to the definitions that make up the resolution. We have, okay, um, okay we have again light coming in from this direction along the optical axis, we have an objective lens that is basically a lens system, can consist of up to 20 lenses. And then we have somewhere our focal plane uh, where we place our sample. And we see that from this focal plane towards the front lens, we get a maximum acceptance cone of light that can enter the objective lens. And this is described by this angle theta here. Um, and that would give us um, what is called the numerical aperture. N is the refractive index here in the medium in front of the objective lens and N times sinus theta is the numerical aperture and that defines our resolution. That value of the numerical aperture is written on every objective lens. So you might think that you'd rather use a 100-fold objective lens um, as compared to maybe a 63-fold objective lens, but if you look closely, you'll find uh, that only this number, the numerical aperture, that is also written on your objective lens, will give you the resolution of your final image. Um, so you need to take good care that you're using a high numerical aperture lens. Um, okay, before I said only this acceptance cone that can enter um, the objective lens defines our resolution. This is strictly not correct. We have to think of the exit pupil here, and uh, this really defines our acceptance cone. Um, the exit pupil is in the so-called Fourier plane, on the back focal plane of the objective lens. And then there's various uh, resolution criteria that have been defined. Um, here is written the red Auralic resolution criteria for circular aperture. Again, what we have here, circular objective lens, circular um, pupil. Um, we find that the resolution is about half the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture. This numerical aperture term is always in the order of 1, so it can be 0 0.5 to maybe one, up to 1, 1.4, 1.45 1 maximum. And that, again, tells us that the resolution is always in the order of half a wavelength. What can be done to increase the numerical aperture is, of course, that we use immersion objective lenses. You can see here what happens if you uh, use an AR objective lens. We find that on the cover slip, most of, most of the light is uh, refracted here, goes to the side and is not detected, is not entering the objective lens, whereas if you apply oil, we find that more light is entering, giving us a higher acceptance cone, giving us basically higher numerical aperture. Again, this angle theta here, <coughs> or especially the term sine theta, can never be uh, larger than one. So the numerical aperture is basically also um, characterized by uh, the refractive index here in front of the objective lens. And when it comes to image formation, we have our object placed in the center here. It can be a small object. If you, if you scan that object through the focal plane, if you move out of focus, you find that the same object is imaged over a broader area, meaning that in this case, uh, the, point, the point in the center here appears smeared out. And this is what you expect. If you move out of focus, it's blurred and it's smeared out further and further, and also the intensity goes down, meaning in this uh, place here, you will barely see this object uh, at all, um, and the same happens, of course, in the other direction. So summarizing uh, the fundamental limitations of optical resolution in, in AP fluorescence microscopy, taking a standard GFP green fluorescent protein with a diameter of about two nanometers, we want to image in our microscope, 
So we place that in a microscope. We have some cell here labeled with GFP molecules. And what we see from this two nanometer object is a diffraction pattern. Um, the image of a, well, it's basically a, like a point source. It's one fluorescent molecule here, one fluorescent protein. And this fluorescent protein uh, makes up a diffraction pattern of roughly 200 nanometers. Um, and this is just simulation image. So <clears throat> the optical resolution you can think of is you place two of these GFP molecules next to each other. If they are very close to each other, these, in, yeah, these diffraction patterns, they will overlap and you cannot resolve them. If you place them 200 nanometers uh, apart, one is here, one is here, you can see two objects. So that's the basic principle of optical resolution in far field light microscopy. So some methods uh, that can be used to overcome the limitations. The first that was introduced is 4-pi microscopy. 4-pi microscopy is a confocal laser scanning technique, meaning it's not a wide field imaging technique. It's one point scanned over the image and the same point is detected. So we use a point detector here. Um, in this case can be avalanche photodiode, it can be a photomultiplier tube. In the case of 4pi, it's an avalanche photodiode. We have a laser for illumination. Then that laser is split in two beams um, of equal intensity by this beam splitter. Half the beam is going this direction, half the beam is going this direction. And they're brought into construct and constructive interference through both sides. So two objective lenses here, and the beam is scanned yeah, on, on parallel on both sides. Um, at the same focal plane. <coughs> and again, the same focal plane is detected. The light is going back, the fluorescence light is going back this direction and this direction and is brought into interference on the detector. What happens if you compare that to conventional confocal images? That is using only one objective lens. In confocal imaging, we have a lateral resolution of about half a wavelength, 200 nanometers and an axial resolution of about 450 nanometers. Um, in this case, where we have two objective lenses from both sides, we have constructive interference in the center, and we have the side lobes on either side um, in the four pi images. So here, basically, instead of one volume that is imaged, we, we image three volumes. Oh, thank you very much. That's also the reason why the images cannot be taken as such, but they need some mathematical processing afterwards. But in principle, um, the volumes on the top and on the bottom, they can be removed mathematically, by some, or computationally, by some algorithms, leaving us with around 110 nanometer Excel resolution, if we are able to remove these so-called side lobes. The 4-pi microscope uses as I said, two microscope objective lenses, so we are very limited in our sample geometry. We have to use two uh, quartz cover, cover slips, or nowadays also um, just standard glass cover slips. The thickness of our sample cannot be much higher than 50 microns, so it's basically used for single cell layer imaging. Um, we also have to apply fluorescent beads for calibration, for adjusting the microscope prior to the measurements. Uh, so we have a couple of limitations, the sample thickness, as I said already, but also the active surface here between the mirrors is uh, about 0.5 square centimeters. So it's very limited. However, of course, we get a better axial resolution at least. Here's a confocal image of uh, an E. coli that was labeled on the uh, membrane. <coughs> you see in the confocal image, uh, a very nice signal from where the membranes are aligned along the optical axis. There's very little signal because it's so noisy where the object is aligned parallel to your <coughs> um, focal plane. In the 4pi image, we see that instead of the one membrane, we have here one membrane, we have a ghost image to the top and to the bottom, and the same happens on the bottom here. Um, 
Meaning that first you look at the sample and you look at the images and you say, well, what's that? We don't have three membranes, but that's just the way the 4Pi works. It gives you ghost images and they need to be removed with some kind of deconvolution. And in the end, you also see this uh, fluorescent bead that has been used for calibrating um, these measurements. And you see a very sharp image here as compared to the confocal microscope. Here's an example where the 4Pi has been used to image mitochondria and live yeast cells. Um, very, very, yeah, that's an, a rendering, of course, because we're already having to deal with deconvolution. We might as well then use some uh, rendering to display our results. So some nonlinear techniques used to overcome the resolution limit in total altogether. The first one I'm going to introduce is structural elimination microscopy just to give you an idea um, on how that works. STAT microscopy, of course, is nowadays also a commercially available microscope. And then there's the other techniques using stochastic imaging, meaning that we record individual flow force over time in a stochastic manner. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, standard flow force, it might also be quantum dots, uh, photo switchable, photo activatable flow force, or in, as in the case of localization microscopy in general, also standard GFP, um, Alexa, dyes, and so on. Basically, all these nonlinear techniques, they rely on fluorescence. They cannot, for now at least, uh, be applied to, um, to wide field transmission imaging, but they can be applied very nicely in fluorescence mode. So photoactivatable, photoswitchable for, uh, proteins, they can switch between a fluorescent and a bright state and a non-fluorescent or dark state. Or they can switch between different fluorescent colors um, or different, um, maybe even different uh, um, fluorescence lifetimes. Switching is done with specific wavelengths, also meaning that switching can be done with laser light from uh, externally. And it, is able to create non-linearities that we need for uh, our highest resolution imaging, for super resolution imaging, need to, uh, is able to create non-linearities at even at low intensities. DRONPA is one of these photoactivatable uh, flow force. It's uh, like a GFP, it's a fluorescent protein, can be switched on by um, shining in laser with 405 nanometers. It can be switched off again by shining in laser with 488 nanometers, but it can also be used the same laser, 488, for imaging the fluorescent protein. It has a fast switching time. It has a high uh, quantum yield, quantum efficiency, and can switch uh, more than 100 times on a single molecule scale. So this can be used in structural elimination microscope. This is just a very uh, general introduction on how this works. Um, so we might have a, cross, uh, a sample with two fluorophores next to each other, and you see the cross section here. So it's pairs of fluorophores that we want to resolve. Um, first, they are all in a dark state, and then we excite them with 405 nanometers by applying a sinusoidal activation. Sinusoidal activation means that we shine in a grating, basically, meaning that we have light in certain areas um, and then a dark next to them. Sinusoidal uh, for the reason that it is very easy to generate. Um, so we have a dark state and some floor force here in the center, they will be activated. Uh, into the bright state, the floor force that are here in the area where there's no light, they cannot be activated and they will remain in the dark state and will remain invisible. And after that, we apply a sinusoidal depletion with a phase shift of 90 degree. Um, so where there was light, where there was light before, there's dark now, and where there was dark before, there's a very high intensity here, and we shine in this additional grating pattern for a very long time. And that would give us a very high probability in this area here for all the photons to be depleted, to be in a dark state again. And only the floor force that are in the center here where there's no light for the, from the depletion, uh, they will remain active. And after that, they can be imaged. Basically, we can, we can image these individual floor force. 
And then, of course, we have to move the pattern. The process has to be repeated over and over again. That already gives you an, uh, an idea. What we're dealing with here is, of course, we have to use much higher integration to overall acquisition times. Another possibility to use uh, this nonlinearity is to use um, saturated excitation. Um, and uh, the results are shown here. With linear structured illumination, we get basically an increase in optical resolution by a factor of two. So instead of 250 nanometers for the wide field images, we get roughly 130 maybe nanometers. In the case of saturated structural illumination, we are here. Uh, we have an experimental result of 59 nanometer um, half width in our images. Um, and that already tells you that we have broken the diffraction barrier. Another method to break this diffraction barrier is to use STAT microscopy. STAT is uh, an acronym for stimulated emission depletion. Again, uh, the fluorophores are depleted from their fluorescent state by shining in not only the excitation spot, as in a confocal laser scanning microscope that will excite all the fluorophores in the volume, um, 450 by 200 nanometers, but we shine in an additional STAT spot. It's not a spot, it's rather a donut mode. It has light all around and is dark in the center. And if we shine that laser light here, the STAT spot, long enough, then only the fluorophore in the very center will remain active and all the fluorophores around, they will be depleted. The advantage of STAT microscopy is that we can in principle also use uh, some sort of standard fluorophores, um, although they have to be very photostable, so it's not uh, all the fluorophores that can be used. And uh, nowadays it has been shown that, that uh, below 20 nanometer optical resolution is achievable with the STATS beam, uh, with the STAT microscopy. Um, the commercial microscope gives you, uh, for a comparison, the confocal microscope, again 250 times 500 nanometer, uh, the confocal, the commercial STAT microscope is around 80 nanometer that uh, the optical resolution that can be achieved. I'm skipping this. Um, okay, here's some um, sub diffraction image uh, as it was achieved by STAT resolution. Um, other possibilities for STAT beam to be designed. So here again is the excitation beam in blue. The stat pulse can be a donut mode only in the lateral direction. So in this direction we have depletion on either side. Uh, but in this direction, the, um, in the axial direction, the um, optical resolution is not increased. Or it can be another beam like this, the stat Z pulse, where we have strong uh, intensities on the bottom and on the top. And we can also overlay the two as you have just seen. And here's an example. Conventional confocal microscopy where this is the stat image of 40 nanometer beads, how they are, nice, how they are nicely resolved. And also here on uh, the SNAP25 proteins, <coughs> and in this case also with deconvolution, we get a very nice image of the resolved individual fluorescent proteins. Some other techniques, they rely on wide field imaging. They make use of blinking, they make use of photo activation, photo switching, or uh, spectral position determination microscopy. Um, here's the very first um, of these techniques that is using quantum dots. And here you see time series of quantum dots. Um, and you cannot really tell from this time series how many quantum dots there are. It might just be one over time. Uh, it's 10 frames that are shown here. And here's the average. Um, however, we can analyze this data by um, independent component analysis, and we find that is, the signal here is, has characteristic blinking events from three quantum, individual quantum dots, and we can color them and overlay them, and we find also the centers of intensities. They are very close together, and they can be resolved with this technique, that using blinking of individual uh, quantum dots. Another technique using photo activation. Here we photo activate again only a very small fraction, a random fraction of our samples of all the fluorophores that are in there uh, by shining in a very low intensity activation light beam. 
And then we look at uh, the individual fluorophores that can be detected. Um, we bleach them eventually, and then we activate a new sample population, a new fraction of our samples. Um, and every time we detect the fluorophore, we draw a little point here, and in the end, after uh, maybe a thousand acquisitions, maybe even more, then we can have our final uh, resulting image, which basically again has surpassed the conventional optical resolution limit. So the basic principle behind all this is to use spectrally assigned localization microscopy. So a spectral signature can be different colors. If we can somehow discriminate the individual flow force, even by their colors, by their lifetime, um, by their blinking characteristic, or some other sort of uh, spectral uh, signature, we can yeah, basically not only detect the, the points, but uh, sorry, the, the, this um, diffraction image of our sample that has a width of around 200 nanometer, but we can also detect the maximum or the center of this diffraction pattern with a very high precision. So instead of the conventional resolution of around 200 nanometers, we have a localization precision that is given by the square root or that is yeah, enhanced by the square root of the number of photons that are detected. So here again might be a CCD camera with the individual um, pixels and you can nicely fit this curve to it and you can determine the position, the center position of your fluor 4 distribution, fluorescent distribution. Here's an example that uses bleaching for this, uh, of these fluor 4s. Um, we find in this case uh, of the nuclear pore proteins, we can nicely resolve the images, we can nicely resolve the nuclear pore proteins. It has been nowadays also shown using localization microscopy or storm microscopy to uh, show individual molecules on, um, on the nuclear pore, um, like this, this ring of proteins, um, they have been resolved. Um, the basic principle, again, is what you do is get all the floor force in the dark state in the beginning and then switch on only a few. So it's a really, it's a stochastic process. You cannot define which, pro which uh, sample population is switched on. So you shine in maybe activation light or you bleach some of the fluorophores or you, you yeah, somehow have another way of discriminating them. Say we switch on a few, place them in your detection channel and only these few, they are imaged. And the basic principle is that you only use, then you only image one molecule per diffraction volume. So each molecule that you are that you want to detect has to be separated from all the other molecules that are stochastically switched on by at least 200 nanometers, by the optical resolution limit. You, de <coughs> you detect all these floor force and afterwards you need to switch them off again um, and then start again by switching on a new stochastic uh, ensemble and detect them and so on and so on. And at all the positions that you detect, you draw a little point, and in the end, that all these points they make up your final image. Um, yeah, give you the position of each flow for. So it's basically a, a single molecule technique um, that allows you to visualize individual flow force. I think I can stop here um, and hand over to the next. Yeah.